morning. This is a celebration of life for Wilmot Augustus Allen. As we celebrate his life, let us also celebrate the giver of life, God the Father Almighty. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruption shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is in the law. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. There remaineth therefore a rest for the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the example of unbelief.
service will follow the order as printed. We will have a selection by the Celestial Choir, followed by a prayer by Reverend George Sims. The Sacred Scripture, the Old Testament, will be read by lay minister Jan Thompson, Jan Brown Thompson from Coke Memorial United Methodist Church in Louisville, Kentucky. The New Testament Scripture will be read by Reverend Alfonso Jones, interim pastor of the Lincoln Heights Methodist Missionary Baptist Church. Thank you. unto the Lord, please. Father, we thank you for this day. Lord God, we thank you for your mercy, for your grace, for your loving kindness. Father God, we thank you for the life of our brother, Brother Wilmot Allen, Father. We thank you for the legacy, Lord. Father God, we thank you, Lord God, for the times, Lord God, that we could just hear, Lord God, his 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 coarse voice, Father God, just ring and resonate with power and with life, Father. 
with words of encouragement. Father God, we speak life over Sister Joyce, Father God, and, and their entire family. Lord God, we ask that you'll bless and keep them, strengthen, protect, and comfort them, Father. Father God, we thank you that Brother Wilmont's legacy, Lord God, lives on, Father, and his wife and his children, Lord God, and, and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Father God, we ask, Lord God, that, that, Lord God, you will bless, Lord God, all of his family, Father. And Father God, we, we know, Father God, that, Lord God, weeping endures for a night, but joy does come in the morning. Father God, we ask that the day star, Lord God, will dawn in their hearts, Father. That, Father God, even, Lord God, as they wipe away tears, Father God, they'll be, Lord God, comforted, Lord God, by fond memories, Father, by words of encouragement, Father. And, Father God, we thank you that even right now, Father, Brother Wilmot, Lord God, has joined that cloud of witnesses that's talked about, Father, in your holy word in Hebrews, the 12th chapter and, and the first verse, Father. And, Lord God, as he looks down from glory, Father God, he's cheering on his wife, Lord God, children and grandchildren, Lord God, his entire family. And, Father God, I ask, Lord God, that you will move on the hearts of all those that are assembled here today, Father, and remind us, Father God, that we have an appointed time, Father, that, Lord God, we will work, Father God, first of all, by making Jesus the Lord of our lives and then serving by loving you, Father God, and loving each other. Father God, we thank you for this day. For, Lord God, this is a day of celebration, Father. For Brother Wilmot has graduated, Father, while we're still walking, Lord God, this road, Father, towards you. Father, we thank you for this day, for your mercy, your grace, and most of all, for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. I will be reading in your hearing Psalms 46, 1 through 5. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I will be reading a new, from the New Testament from the book of the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verses number 1 through 4. And I'll be reading from the New Standard Bible, New American Standard Bible. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. That where I am, there you will be also. And, and you know the way where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going, and how do we know the way? Jesus said, I am the way, and the truth, and the light. No one comes to the Father but through me. The last two 
took it to the sixth verse. May God have, have the blessing of the reading of his word. We will have acknowledgments by Sister Ella Reverly, followed by tributes, and they will come in this order. Kirsten Boyd, a granddaughter. Randolph Allen will be giving tributes for his brother Calvin Alvin Allen, Peter Knox, a friend, and Reverend Alfonso Jones, interim pastor of the Lincoln Heights Missionary Baptist Church. Good morning, Joyce, family, Quinn Chapel, members, and friends. Resolution of respect for our own Mr. Wilmot A. Allen. Our honorable reflections and resolution in memory of Brother Wilmot A. Allen. Whereas Brother Wilmot A. Allen, gracious spirit leaves an indelible impression with all he encountered. As a fellowship of believers, we stand firm with conviction in Christ Jesus that there is no failure and there is no end, only new beginnings. We are confident that the one who has begun a good work in Brother Allen has now completed that work and has called him home to his reward. Whereas Brother Wilmot A. Allen was a caring person who loved God and his family, he was a dedicated member of Quinn Chapel Trustee Board and he was a faithful to the life of Quinn. Whereas that we stand in joyful praise and thanksgiving because we know if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, but eternal in the heavens. Therefore, we will not fear. We are not left alone nor has Brother Wilmot A. Allen been forsaken. To the entire family of Brother Wilmot A. Allen, please know that our prayers, concerns, and love are with you today and always. Be it resolved on this 24th day of May, a copy of this resolution will be given to the family, a copy placed in the archives of Board of Stewards of Quinn Chapel AME Church, and a copy placed in the church files. Humbly submitted, Quinn Chapel AME Church, Reverend Dr. Jermaine Covington, Senior Pastor. From the Cincinnati Postal Service Retired Alumni Group, their resolution. Whereas Wilmot A. Allen passed away Friday, May 13th, 2022, he was the husband of retired postal clerk, Joyce Allen. Whereas the passing of Wilmot A. Allen has created a lasting void in the lives of his family, friends, and associates. Whereas the Cincinnati Postal Service's retired alumni family acknowledges with sadness the passing of Wilmot and wishes to offer a formal expression of sympathy to the entire Allen family. Now therefore be it resolved that the executive officers and the members of the Cincinnati Postal Service Retired Alumni Group hereby extend their deepest sympathy to the Allen family on the loss of their loved one. Be it further resolved that this resolution is tendered to the Allen family as an expression of condolence from the Cincinnati Postal Service Retired Alumni Group files. We, the duly qualified officers of the Cincinnati Postal Service Retired Alumni Group, do hereby certify that the foregoing is true and correct. This copy of the resolution ratified by the Executive Board. Amen. God bless you. Will those who are giving tributes please come to the microphone to my right? 
Kirsten Boyd, Randolph Allen, Peter Knox, Reverend Alfonso Jones will give his tributes. Hello, everybody. My name is Kirsten. I'm Papa's first grandchild. This is definitely a bittersweet moment. Um, it was hard seeing him in his last few years, but some of my fondest memories with my grandfather was as a little girl. He used to pick me up from school. And I honestly did not come to the realization until a couple of days ago. I talked to my grandma. My school was literally maybe five minutes from the house, tops. But Papa used to drive me across the bridge to Newport, Kentucky every day. He picked me up, and we would stop at this little convenience store, <laughs> and he would buy me a box of Boston baked beans. I was probably the only little girl asking for Boston baked beans. And um, he's just going to be truly missed. Um, I miss him asking me. Uh, every time I open up the fridge, he asks me, are you here to eat up all my food? Yes, I am. <laughs> And I used to always want to walk around the house barefoot. It used to kill Papa. Put on some shoes, put on some socks. <laughs> and um, I just, sometimes I wish my little sister, my younger siblings, got to see him during those times in his prime. But um, oof, this was very hard. But um, I love you, we love you. And um, I just want to end it right here. <laughs> I'm standing in the absence of my brother, Calvin Allen. Um, he was not able to make it here today. Um, I am the nephew of Uncle Wilmot from Charleston, South Carolina. My wife and I, we drove up just um, to come and say our final goodbye to my uncle. Uncle Wilmot was uh, my father's the youngest brother. And uh, I just can't. Mm. Sorry. Mm. Uncle Wilmot was my, young, my father's youngest brother. Uncle Wilmot, I just came to say goodbye to you. We love you. Joyce. Um, Holding on to God's unchanging hand. And that's, that's it. Thank you. My name is Peter Knox. I'm a member of Quinn Chapter. And it's a strange relationship that turned out to be a rich relationship with Wilma and Allen. In the late 70s, beginning in 1980, the church that you now sit in was a little one-room church on Willow Avenue over here in Glendale. And when the pastor changed for that 1970 year, when Reverend Donald Jordan took over that leadership, the pastorship of this church, he went out and recruited people that I would have never never understood how he reached out to him. He reached out to me because he saw me sitting with my wife in church on Sunday and, and he asked the background. He knew me from Oxford, Ohio. He went to Miami University and I did too after he had already graduated. So he knew of me, but he had not had any communication. So he asked me to come be a membership and the first thing you knew, Myself and another gentleman by the name of Leland Ramey became the finance committee of that church and handled the collection and counting the money and that kind of thing. The next time I looked up, I knew I saw this tall man who eventually became a trustee. And I didn't know him, but the truth be told that he lived two streets down from me. But we never met. The circle that he moved in, the circle I moved in, never came together. 
And I got to know him as a man who really loved the church, practiced what he preached, and you could count on being accountable for whatever he was assigned. Big man, but soft-spoken. And he took the responsibility of having, because of his business experience, helped the pastor at that time, who was also a businessman. They came together in, in some circles and arranged the purchase of this lot here at Southland and Sharon Road because the church wanted to move, but they didn't have a place to move to. So in terms of not only purchasing the land, he was involved. He knew how to arrange the purchase of land because he was a realtor at that time. And he became very instrumental in the business that had to be done before the first brick was laid in this church. Now, the church was built in sections. The first section was what we now call the fellowship hall. And when the pastor said that we had to buy the three, two and a half acres up here to build that particular section, again, Wilma was our primary advisor in terms of how to get that deal done. He knew the owner, knew what the price was, and enabled this church to negotiate a land, uh, the sale of that land, two and a half acres here on this corner. Well, that wasn't the end of it. As soon as uh, we built that piece up, the pastor announced that, well, we're not done yet. We got another section to build. Little did I know that that section was gonna cost us over a million dollars. And so the, the trustee board and the other members of this church really had a tough job ahead of us. Again, well, my Allen was kind of in the forefront of that, helping us find the money and then part of the building fund drive that enables to have enough money to even borrow money. So he's been a faithful member of Quinn. Well, I got to know him more deeply because I was a trustee by that time. And we met at church, talked at church, and I always would see him sometimes sitting in that back corner over there, and we'd talk after church. And finally, it became a case where that Wilman started to have a problem with his health that health would eventually take his life. First, his vision went, and he couldn't drive. I remember one morning he came in Sunday, he used to drive a big old Cadillac. Well, we have a chain across that gate that somebody forgot to move, and he rolled into that gate, and the next day I heard him complain, who didn't open the gate, who didn't open that gate? So he, he, you know, he was coming to church one way or another, you know, you weren't gonna keep him away. Well, after that, we began to work seriously on this part of the church. Again, Wilmot was involved with putting the plans together. At that time, I became the building committee chairman, which I didn't know I was a building committee chairman until he signed me. And we worked together on laying out the plans and trying to get orders and lining up people who were going to build this church. I never saw a man who ever was so dedicated with what he promised to do. And as we develop a friendship, friendship, once he lost his vision, you know, I would stop by and we'd talk, or we'd talk over the phone. And he, despite of that fact, always kept a good spirit, always hopeful, always thinking that this is going to pass. I'm going to still be active. Well, it got worse rather than better. And then the next thing that happened was he lost his legs. And when he couldn't do that, he couldn't, he couldn't come to church on his own. He had to rely on, I think, visitation from members as well as the church was recording at that time and he could hear the videos of the church. Couldn't see him, but he, but he was part of that. Well, the journey wasn't over and the suffering wasn't over. The next thing he lost was his kidneys. And at that time, he was really pretty much bedridden. And then I'd come down to visit, and we'd talk. We solved all the world's problems sitting there. And I acquainted him with what was happening in the church at that time. And it just amazed me. I mean, instead of being critical of his condition or complaining about his condition, he tried to be part of what was going on in the day-to-day. -day. He asked me how the church was going. We talked about worlds. He talked to his favorite teams, the Cincinnati Bearcats and the Bengals. He always wanted to know, what did I think about the game? He was just like his old days.
in terms of how his mind was working. And we just really just formed a bond where I tried to make it an every week a conversation with him at some time and also a public visit for him face to face. That all stopped when obviously COVID became a problem. I, I didn't want to bring something into the house that would make matters worse. And through that whole thing, uh, I mean, I just, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. He kept such a wonderful spirit, a good attitude, no matter the suffering that he went through. And he suffered, trust me. You know, in the hospital, when he had to go into dialysis, and he came back. At times I talked to him, he says, well, boy, I was a rough one. But he stayed positive. That only could have happened if he had a relationship with Jesus Christ. You know that. He believed in it. We talked about it. We prayed about it. But it wasn't to be. And when I got that call on May the 13th early from Reverend Turner that he had passed, I... It was rough. I didn't know what to do. But I sucked it up. Eventually, called Joyce, saw how she was, and she said her family was coming and she'd be all right. But that, also that friend was one of the most tragic things in my life. A man who has suffered so hard so long didn't make it. So, you know, I just, I just prayed that he would be at rest and that, you know, God was at God's down in a better place than he was down here on earth. So I say, brother, rest in peace. You're in God's hand. Amen. First of all, on behalf of the Lincoln Heights Missionary Baptist Church family, we offer our sincere condolences to the family. Joyce, faithful, faithful worker in the church. And then when she could no longer work in the church, she worked in her home taking care of her husband, Wilmot Allen. We met Wilmot and Joyce Allen in the 1974. We moved up from Kentucky, and lo and behold, we became next door neighbors to them out on Arborwood, 101 2 Arborwood Drive. They had one up, they had town, one had town on, we had one right next to them. And interesting thing was this big tall man big guy you couldn't understand what he was saying because what, what are you talking about well you talk about it. you know talk about it. you know because he was from South Carolina now I'm from Kentucky now we talk funny in Kentucky but we don't talk like Wilma did so it took me a long while to get to know him and get to understand the language and the lingo of how he was speaking. But he was, I found out that he was a very kind, loving man, determined, always on the go, never a dull moment in his life, always moving and always going. As a matter of fact, he had a, a maid service. At one time, I don't know what I was doing, but he said, well, why don't you come work with me one day? So we go up the Blue Ash, and there's an old home up there, no longer there, of course, now. That's before they put all of those buildings and everything in there. And we went in this building, cobwebs all over the place, and, you know, we didn't know what was all in this place. I said, well, my, what are we doing up here? He said, we're going to clean this place up. I said, are you serious? We're going to clean this place up for what? And because they were telling you they were going to do a showing up there, you know, a showing of the property back in the day when they sold it. So we went to the cleaning. But lo and behold, uh, once we got it clean, you know, it was a really beautiful home, but just been left abandoned for many years. But we cleaned it, and he had a determination, a determination that whatever he set out to do, he was going to get it done. And that's the most fascinating thing about 
my relationship with Brother Wilmot is no matter what he had on his mind to do, he was going to get it done. Whether it was in real estate, whether it was in the insurance, whether it was in the maid service, whatever it might be, whatever, taking care of the kids, whatever it might be, he got it done. As a matter of fact, we got to talking one time about, I don't know where y'all are familiar with South Carolina, they have something called boiled, boiled peanuts. Now, I know I eat peanuts, but I don't eat no boiled peanuts. And, you know, but he, he, he looked at me like I was crazy, okay? But then until I started going to South Carolina on a regular basis to visit, did I understand and appreciate the history of South Carolina. And all of a sudden, we knew more because I was in, uh, visiting his neighborhood and his community. But Joyce, you had a good man. You had a very good man. Y'all were faithful to each other for a long period of time. Y'all kept each other. Even when you were down, he kept you up. And then when he went down, you kept him up. And that's the kind of love and the kind of relationship that every man and woman who's married to one another, they need to understand that. That when one's going through something, that's not time to turn your head and walk away. But it's time to gird your loins by the power of the Holy Spirit and lift the other person up. So God might reveal to you what it is he desires for you to do later in life. So Wilmot, you did a great job, you outstanding job, but Joyce Allen, you did an outstanding job as a caregiver. You did what we try to beg nursing homes to do right now today, with three shifts of people, or two shifts of people, whatever they do today. We can't get them to do what you did for one person. You did 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You talking about doing some work, kiddo. You showed your roots. You showed your godliness. You showed your faithfulness. And you show what the Proverbs 31 woman says, you do what you do, what you got to do to take care of your family and make sure your family is taken care of right to the end. Wilmot fought the fight. He kept the faith. He's now gone on to glory. No longer without legs. Don't have to worry about it anymore because his spirit has now been set free. And the Spirit now has been able to look over the portal of heaven and say, Joyce, keep on pushing. Joyce, keep on running. Because I got your back because you had mine while I was here. You keep on going. We're going to make it. And I'll see you again one day, soon and very soon, when all God's children will get up and say, Howdy, howdy, and no more goodbyes. Perhaps many of you have already read the obituary. So in the interest of time, uh, we will ask you to take the program with you and read it at a later time. It's a beautifully written obituary. We will have a selection now, a medley by Minister Melissa Brown, followed by the eulogy and the benediction. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. But sometimes I wonder what he can do through me. No wondrous works to show. <laughs> no goodness of my own. But in my weakness, he's there to let me know. His strength is perfect. When our strength is gone, he'll carry us. When we can't carry on, raising his.
his power the weak become strong his strength is perfect his strength is so take me to the king I don't have much to bring my heart is torn in pieces it's my offering leave me at the throne to worship him alone to gaze upon his glory and sing to him my song Joyce, I can hear you say, I miss his love, his smile, his laughter. I was my protector. I love you stronger through the trials that life would bring. I hear you say, Father, you were our strength and our strong tower. In prayer, you gave us to make it through until this very hour raised in his power the weak become strong we become strong is perfect His strength is perfect Yes it is Rise in His power The weak become strong is perfect His strength Amen. To Joyce and to Joyce, to Richard, Dr. Wilmot, Simeon, grandchildren, other family members and friends, our pastor, the Reverend Dr. Jermaine D. Covington, regrets that he was unable to be here today, but his prayers are certainly with you. And surely you have felt the prayers of the many for your consolation. And I pray that this service brings you some additional comfort. However, we know that God is the source of all comfort and peace. We have a glimpse of the life of Wilmot Augustus Allen in this beautifully written obituary, but it is only a brief biographical account. Even more brief is the person's life documented between two dates, connected by a dash, indicating the range of time one has lived in this world with the dash serving somewhat like a microchip, capturing everything. And along that dash are opportunities for each person to plan, establish priorities, and to live one's best life. Because we find in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verses 15a and c, for we are foreigners and strangers before thee, as were all our fathers, and there is none abiding. However, there is along that dash in this world the opportunity for a defining moment whereby we can extend one's life beyond the connected dates, but not in one's own state, the natural state. C.S. Lewis said, once a man is united with God, 
how could he not live forever? In John chapter 3, verses 5 through 7, Jesus shares this opportunity with Nicodemus. Except a man be born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. For most services of celebrations of life, the opening scripture is often what Jesus states as an undeniable truth. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. For with salvation, one's status is changed. Scripture informs one is no longer a stranger and foreigner, but a fellow citizen with the saints and of the household of God. And so we find from the onset of this new life, the spiritual life runs concurrently with the mortal life and has the power to influence it. There would be in this new life evidence of love, faith, and hope to be shared as what allowed it to be. And when the mortal life ends as one cannot abide, the spiritual lives on into eternity. There was no doubt Wilmot Allen took advantage of the wonderful opportunity. Now I direct you to the scripture which is in a way summarizes what I've shared. And I believe the scripture clearly defines Wilmot Allen. The scripture reference is John chapter 16, verse 33, which reads in the King James Version, In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Note that Jesus was speaking here to his disciples, informing them that they would not be exempt from suffering, although they were his followers. And he also shared an appropriate response when faced with tribulation, so they could not be discouraged or feel defeated. Be of good cheer. It was not only a message for the disciples, but it's also a message for all believers those who, when God reveals himself to them and the saving work of his son, meet that defining moment affirmatively, becoming followers of Jesus as his disciples. And how can believers suffer tribulation and still be of good cheer? Because the victory is already won. Believers, therefore, have the peace of God. And by looking long range, looking at what Jesus has done, to mitigate tribulation by overcoming death and the grave. His victory then becomes the victory of believers. At each stage of life, we really will experience trials and tribulations. However, if we are blessed to enter that late stage of life, as Wilmot did, it is often the most challenging, as Brother Knox has already informed us. For it is here that more constraints are, um, are incumbent upon us. Eric Erickson, a German psychologist, known for his theories of personalities and psychosocial development, identified this late onset stage as characterized by integrity versus despair. Integrity won for those who were satisfied with their lives and therefore aged with grace. There was a feeling of pride in what had been accomplished and a demonstration of a willingness to share that wisdom with others. However, despair settled upon those who never felt a sense of accomplishment and rather focused on regrets. We can discern from his obituary and understand from our own life's experiences with Wilmot that integrity won for him also, and he lived his life without regrets. Erickson also said, Hope is both the earliest and the most indispensable virtue, inherit, inherit in the state of being alive. If life is to be sustained, hope must remain, even when confidence is wounded and trust impaired. It is often, often in this stage that believers will share past memories, but because of their hope, they are also looking expectantly to their future. So as Wilmot experienced more and more losses and suffering was compounded, 
I believe well might focus more intently on the second part of the message of Jesus, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So his faith never seemed to waver and his hope remained sure. Everyone with whom Wilmot engaged, whose life journey has crossed his, becomes a part of that dash. Let me share where my sister Glenda and I intersected and what we observed over the years. Of course, we knew Wilmot as a member of Quinn Chapel. However, it was not until his health began to decline that we became more involved. We began meeting with Wilmot and Joyce first in person and then by phone during the pandemic. Demic. There was always such an atmosphere of peace in their house, and the love for each other was unmistakable. What was evident was that Wilmot had a clear understanding of what happens in this world, but also an unshakable conviction of how one overcomes this world. After he and Glenda would discuss the latest sports news and he had inquired about his beloved Quinn Chapel, Wilmot would then give space for Joyce to talk before we sang the songs of Zion, read scriptures, and prayed. There were days when he would report having had a rough day prior to our meetings, but then would quickly say, it'll be all right. I thought this was a new response to those difficult days but Joyce informed this was a signature statement used earlier in his life, and so it had remained with him over the years. He could say that because he believed, I believe he held firmly to the end, the confidence he had at the beginning of his new life that it was well with his soul. More than two years ago, Joyce, you shared on several occasions that you observed him sleeping so soundly you struggled to arouse him. To this, Wilmot responded, I was making a trial run. It wasn't that he did not know where he was going, but perhaps he wanted to experience a foretaste. Then about two months ago, while we were on conference call, Wilmot said, well, I'd better call my old friend Preston. And he continued sharing regarding his desire to, for burial in what he called the Air Force Cemetery. And he continued this line of conversation. He would not allow anyone else to speak until he had finished what he had planned to say. Wilmot had been a businessman. He was a planner, a manager, and he truly loved his family. And so he wanted to make sure everything was in order before his departure. As his challenges increased and his doctors shared what they believed and recommended, Wilmot likely rehearsed the words of Jesus, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And so he continued to trust in what God had promised him. I do not know what Wilmot experienced on those trial runs. He never shared with us. Perhaps inexplicable beauty serenity, joy, and freedom. Perhaps he heard these words, your light afflictions, which are but for a moment, are working for you a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. From the vantage point of eternity, the afflictions experienced in this world would now appear light and even momentary. So as the years and months went by, the lure for Wilmot to make a permanent run likely became more appealing. Joyce, you shared that after Wilmot was confident that you would be all right. And on the morning of his departure, he called the role of his beloved family members, inquiring if they were all right as well. And you assured them, him, that they were. And when you left his bedside to prepare for your appointment, Wilmot already prepared, quietly slipped away to keep his own appointment. No more challenges, no more constraints. Wilmot was now free to move from that second date on the dash to do as Jesus had done, overcoming death and the grave, extending his life to be present with the Lord. 
I tell you, with the passing of time, Wilmot's name will likely not be remembered in this world for his academic and athletic accomplishments, nor remembered for his successful entrepreneurship. But by doing what was essential, his name will be remembered forever as it is recorded in the Book of Life. And this is the rich legacy Wilmot Allen leaves us. I will end with some of the words from the poem written by John G. McGee called High Flight. And he says, oh, I have slipped the surly bonds of earth and danced the skies on laughter's silvered wings. Somewhere I've climbed and joined the tumbling mirth of sun split clouds and done a hundred things you have not dreamed of. Up, up where never lark no evil eagle flew and while with silent lifting mine, I trod that untrespass sanctity of space, put out my hand and touch the face of God. I have the benediction by the Rep Reverend Albert Matthews, retired presiding elder of the AME Church, followed by the recession. Father and our God, we thank you for the words of encouragement that have been shared. We ask, Father God, now as we prepare to depart from this place, that you continue to keep your arms around this family, these friends, and all who are here. And now we ask that your peace remain with them until we return again at another time. May the grace of our Lord and Savior and the communion of his Holy Spirit may it rest, rule, and abide with us all until we meet again. Amen. Pastor Charles and his staff come. Would all who are able please stand except for the family for the recessional and please remain standing until the family has recessed. And Preston Charles will give us some final instructions.